Hello, I'm Gary Howell. I'm the founder of Morgan Walsh Consultancy. We provide IT services to local government and also commercial companies. We're going to look at the uh, LoRaWAN outdoor gateway from Multitech called the Conduit IP67 and specifically how to add it to the Things Network version 3 and set up packet forwarding and also basic station protocols. If you followed our setup video, you should now have something like this. So you should now plug the yellow cable into the laptop and your power cable into the mains. You'll also need your SIM details, so APN and if necessary username and password, and also a login to Device HQ, which you can set up yourself at devicehq.com. It's a free registration. The gateway will allocate an IP address to you in this range.2.1. So go to this address on your browser. And you'll probably see a security risk warning like this because the certificate used is self-signed. Uh, however, click Advanced in Firefox and then accept the certificate. This takes you to the commissioning screen where you can uh, add a username. I'm using admin here. And then a nice secure password. And repeat. And I log in using those credentials. If you're using the latest version of firmware, we're running 5.3.3 here. Uh, it brings up a first time wizard and this is worth running through. So click next. The calling home feature should be enabled, so click enabled, but do not click the call home button yet. On the next screen, we have the current time from the real time clock. If it's way off, then you can uh, set up the time here. This is the network configuration, which is fine by default. And note the IP address here, which is the IP address of the gateway. If you have a SIM card, uh, then you need to enable here and type in the APN. Not required of using Ethernet, of course. And on the next screen, you have the option to add your PAP or CHAP credentials if necessary for your SIM login. On the next screen, we should enable remote management. This is a connection to Device HQ, and we'll also need the account key from Device HQ. So we'll switch over to that now. Go to your account information and copy the key. Back to the gateway and paste that in and click Next. The access screen is essentially for the web browser to the gateway um, and this is enabled on HTTPS and only access via the LAN and not via the WAN. And on the final screen, the bootloader protection, you can set a password if that's necessary for you. So with that saved, we now need to click the red Save and Apply button in the top left. And click the OK to confirm. And finally, OK to reboot. The gateway takes about two or three minutes to reboot, and once it does, you can now log back in. And we'll now take a look at some of the other settings. So on the network interface screen, you can see we have Ethernet, uh, the SIM, PPP, and also a bridge between the two. On the WAN configuration, uh, this is basically for failover, so you can have Ethernet and cellular. And the options on the right will determine when the failover happens. So it's mostly based on a ping. The unit does support dynamic, dynamic DNS if you require that. And the DHCP server runs by default. If you are running Ethernet uh, on a corporate network, you'll want to turn this off. And that's done here. And you would normally click Submit. However, we're going to click Cancel as we require this on for us.
the unit supports SMTP uh, for sending email status messages and also SNMP for monitoring over the network. The real-time clock can be set here and it's normally updated via an SMTP which is set here. We enabled cellular earlier uh, with our APN uh, with no authentication. If you need uh, the, to ping occasionally to keep the SIM connection up, you can do that here. And the remaining settings are sensible. Here's the radio status, and really usefully it shows the current network. We're currently on EE, uh, and also we're on 4G, but it'll also show 2 or 3G. This is really useful if you have a roaming SIM like ours. And you can do the radio firmware update on the next item. Moving on to firewall, uh, all outbound settings by default are allowed and nothing incoming, and you can change those as needed. Uh, the unit also supports SMS messaging to send a request to the gateway over SMS uh, and to receive information back. It also uh, allows you to set critical settings like APN, or change it, and also to be able to enable or disable the uh, connection to device HQ again via SMS. It does require a password uh, towards the bottom of the screen, uh, and you can see the format underneath that uh, that you need to use. It does support sending SMSs out and also keeps a log of received and sent messages. On the tunneling side, it supports GRE, uh, IPsec and open VPN tunnels, which are really useful options uh, for remote connection to the gateway uh, if you're behind a firewall. Administration-wise, you can create a new user. Uh, I normally create a monitoring user, which allows read-only access to this interface without doing any changes, which is quite useful. And then under access configuration, this allows us access to the uh, web interface, uh, which we said earlier. I normally set the timeout slightly larger than four, five minutes to ten. Uh, SSH settings, uh, so enable that on the LAN, so we can get by the command line to the gateway. Essentially, it's a Linux box, and it also supports uh, reverse SSH tunneling, which again is another useful option for remote support. And the remaining settings are sensible again does support radius, radius uh, for your user authentication as well. On the remote management side, uh, this is essentially the connection to device HQ. Uh, this is enabled, as we did it earlier, over SSL, and here's our account key. Uh, I like to change the check-in interval to about four hours uh, when setting these up. That's the minimum, by the way, uh, just so that it checks in more often, but you can change that as necessary. And finally, I like to again allow configuration upload from here. You may notice that uh, when I'm changing something, uh, you need to click the uh, submit button at the bottom. And it's worth noting that when you do that, the save and apply button goes red at the top left, and this shows that there is now something to save and apply, of course, uh, which uh, sets, saves the settings into permanent memory. In our case, we're now going to click the uh, Check in Device HQ button, and what this will do will send a message to Device HQ using the key we put in earlier. And we now switch over to Device HQ and click the Refresh button. We'll see the gateway now appears on here. Uh, it has some basic details along the line, and clicking on it will bring up some more detailed information. We'll come back to this later. Back on the gateway. Notifications. Uh, so it'll send out uh, different notifications based on uh, certain events over email or SMS. You can customize the web UI if you wish. And more importantly, uh, you can upgrade the firmware here. So we're on 5.3.3. .3. So if a later version comes out, you can upgrade the firmware on this screen. Save and restore item is really useful. Uh, we can save a configuration file, so the complete configuration to a file on our hard drive, and of course restore the same here. Another useful option here is to be able to do a complete factory reset. Uh, so that's done here, uh, and that basically sets it to uh, essentially a new machine. And there's various other options here. 
On the save uh, status and logs, uh, this shows status of network traffic and also which services are running or not running on the gateway. Under commands, the uh, useful ones here are restart device, so you can restart it from the web interface, which is really useful if you're doing this remotely. And also you can restart just the LoRaWAN services there. We're now going to click Save and Apply. This will require a reboot. And while we're doing that, we'll uh, have a look at Device HQ. So on the home screen, uh, we can see on the map a list of our devices, just one in this case. And on the device list, again, uh, listed one line at a time with uh, basic information shown. You can add extra columns by clicking the Columns button in the top right. When you click on a gateway, uh, you can see basic details, including usefully the IMSI number from the SIM, if you need to track that. Also, its GPS position. The uh, cellular uh, status, including stress signal strength, and very importantly, the Ethernet address that's been allocated, which is really useful if you're on an external DHCP server. Shows check ins, it also shows a history of signal strength, so you know with how your SIM is performing. Similarly, on the network tab, you can see how much traffic has been used on the Ethernet and also over the SIM, which is useful for SIM management. We'll come back to LoRa in a second. And device device files. These are logs and files, uh, configuration files, which you can download from here. So now the gateway is rebooted. We're going to log in, and then we're going to start setting up the LoRaWAN. So over in the uh, Things console, uh, in the gateways, we add a gateway. Type in a unique gateway ID. And then copy the gateway EUI from the uh, gateway interface here. Uh, copy the gateway server address, in this case it's Europe. If you're able to, I would leave the status and location as public, if that's possible, for your organization. We need to select here our frequency plan, so for us it's Europe. And leave duty cycle enabled, enforce, I'm sorry. And the time delay of 5.30 seconds is the standard. And do not enter anything in the gateway updates, as that's not for multi-tech. Clicking create gateway. And then going to the uh, Live Data tab, we'll show that the gateway was created. Now switching back to uh, LoRaWAN on the gateway. So we're going to select uh, Packet Forwarder here. And as you can see, the service is stopped currently. We need to select our channel plan, which is Europe in our case. The other settings should be left as default. The duty cycle uh, is by not enabled again by default, which is fine. Um, and then here are the gateway IDs. In our case, we've got two network cards in here uh, for LoRaWAN, but you may only have one. And the uh, intervals are fine. This is the important bit. Under server, we've got you can select different networks, but I would suggest manual, and then paste in your server address that we copied earlier from the Things Network, and change the up and down ports to 1700. Note you may need to open those ports on your firewall, and the rest is fine. So you can see the service is still stopped, and that's because we haven't clicked the Save and Apply button, so we'll do that now. And now the service is running. Switching over to the uh, console in uh, the Things Network, we can see the gateway is connected. It sent its first status message, which is this one here. And then if I turn a device on here, I will get a join request. There we are. And finally, some data from the device itself. This is a uh, Arduinus uh, field testing device. So there's some data from a sensor. So that's working. We're going to now change the method of connection from packet forwarder to basic station. Basic station is the preferred method of connection of gateways to the Things Network. 
And the way that it works is that the gateway needs permission to send and receive messages from the uh, LNS on the Things Network, and this is managed through an API security key. The API key itself is managed by the CUP server, the Configuration Update Server, which is essentially a management layer on top of the API key. And the way that it works is that when the gateway starts up, it requests from the CUP server the LNS key, and the CUP server, as long as the gateway is authenticated with CUPs, will send the LNS key to the gateway, and the gateway then uses the LNS key to then send its subsequent messages. One change to this presentation is that previously the LNS key had to be saved to the Things Network via the command line interface on Linux or Mac. Uh, fortunately, this has now been changed and it can be entered directly in the web browser on the Things Network, and we'll show you that shortly. So we're going to need two API keys. The first one is the uh, CUPS API key. So the naming convention uh, should be used similar to this. So it's very clear what the key actually is. When we create a key, we allocate individual rights. So for the CUP server, we need view gateway information, retrieve secrets, and also edit basic gateway settings. At the bottom of the screen then, we need to create uh, the API key by clicking the blue button. This creates the secret API key, which you must now copy and save safely. This is the only place this key uh, appears, so it's very important that it's saved safely. And once done so, we can now click I have copied the key. Second, we need to create the LNS API key. So the naming convention again, similar, but with LNS. And we need to grant the individual right of being able to uh, write uplinks and read downlinks. This is the section here. Copy and save your key safely. And then click I have copied this key. We now need to add this LNS API key to the CUPS part of the system within Things Network. And this is done on the Gateway General Settings screen. Scroll down to the LoRa Basic Station LNS Authentication Key Box and paste in your key. Now scroll to the bottom and click Save Changes. If you scroll back up, you'll see the LNS key has been replaced with some hieroglyphics, and this is just an encoded string. Note when you refresh this screen, the LNS Authentication Key is empty. This doesn't mean it's lost, it just means that you may enter a new key if necessary. But if you do click the Save Change at the bottom with a blank key, the key is not deleted. Back here then on the uh, gateway, we now need to set the credentials for card 1. In our case, uh, we have two cards, you may only have one. The URI, so we set cups and the credentials, and then the URI is HTTPS. Then the name of the network server, uh, which in the case is the Things That Work Europe. And finally, the port number 443 on the end. The service certificate uh, we need to, this is basically a root service certificate, which we need to get from the web. We'll get ours from the uh, Let's Encrypt server. So we'll switch over to that. Save that and open it in the text editor. Copy the certificate. And then paste that into the server certificate box on the gateway. We'll leave gateway certificate uh, blank. However, we need to now get the uh, CUPS uh, key, which we copied earlier from the API settings, and then prefix it with authorization colon space, with authorization spelt with a Z. Note this uh, apparent line break here is not, it's just one continuous line which the browser has just broken uh, into two lines. In our case, we need to put something in the uh, uh, second LoRaWAN radio. So we're going to select cups and then just paste in the URI, which is the same as card one. Uh, but you'd normally put in, of course, your um, credentials for the second LoRaWAN service in here. Click Submit. 
and then go back and click Save and Apply. And so now the basic station is now running on the gateway. So now you can see the disconnect when we disconnected the uh, packet forwarder and now the gateway has requested the uh, CUPS server to send the API key, hence the attribute upload to the gateway, so that's the LNS key going off. The gateway then connected and finally sent its very first uh, status. Now from here you won't see any further updates from the gateway apart from any traffic that comes through from sensors. So in summary, we've set up the uh, Multitech IP67. Uh, we've shown the packet forwarding method of connecting to the Things Network. And then finally, we switched that over to the basic station. Note that the um, packet forwarder is not currently running. It's only the uh, one or the other. We hope you find that's useful. Uh, if we can help in any way, please do get in touch. And thanks very much for watching.